This is Professor Corey, and this mini lecture covers material from our final lecture on chemical kinetics. In the previous lecture, we talked about the method of initial rates to determine our rate law expression, and then the integrated rate laws, and we even mentioned a graphical method that can be used to determine the reactant order if there is only one reactant. In this lecture, we will talk about half-life, potential energy diagrams, and a brand new equation that relates the rate law constants to time and activation energy for a reaction. First, I just want to briefly review the integrated rate laws. This slide here gives a, a brief review. You can pause the video and give it a read. I don't want to read it. But I do want to show the integrated rate laws um, just so you can get comfortable and familiar with these. They will be provided. Um, the, the subscript zero just means um, at time zero. So the R in brackets is the concentration of the reactant at time zero. The brackets usually indicate concentration. It's usually molarity. We can use mass for this. You might see some other units, usually molarity. So the other concentration with the subscript T just means this is the concentration at some other time, not the initial concentration, at some other time. We've got our good old friend, the rate law expression constant K and T for time. I'm sure you heard about half-life before, but what it is, it's an amount of time during which the concentration of your reactant is half of the original value. The cookie in this image has a half-life of one night. Each night, half of what was present the previous night remains. Realize that the, the amount is not the same. The second night, we lost half of an entire cookie. And the third night, we only lost half of a half of a cookie. We can represent the half-life as the initial concentration divided by 2. This is the new concentration, or concentration at time t. t to the 1 half just means half-life. What follows are the equations used to find the half-life for zero, first, and second order reactions. Notice that our rate law constant k is involved. If we have the half-life, we can solve for k for a first order reaction. We will need the initial concentration to solve for k for zero or second order reactions. Half-life is typically associated with radioactive decay, and all radioactive decay follows first order kinetics. This problem requires two steps. First, we have to use the given half-life to find the rate law constant, k. Once we have k, we can use the integrated rate law to solve the problem. Pause the video and examine the process of solving the problem. If my writing on the previous slide did not make any sense, this is the answer typed. Personally, I prefer my writing. Another problem with a similar approach. We use the half-life to find the rate law constant, and then we use the first order integrated rate law. The answer is at the bottom right, 0.0938 milligrams. Again, I recommend pausing the video and just try to follow the work. Then, later, you want to try to solve this problem on your own. This problem has a second order reaction, so the half-life equations and the integrated rate laws are for second order. Both will be provided, but you'll have to understand how and when to use them. Early in the chapter, we introduced potential energy diagrams. Now we'll look at them in more detail. Notice that the reactants have to gain energy to the amount of the activated complex before they can go to products. The amount of energy needed is called the activation energy. A good example of this is burning firewood. The reactants would be firewood and oxygen, which is present in the air. In order to form products, there needs to be enough energy to overcome the activated complex. Wood doesn't just burn on its own unless we give it some energy. Once the reaction is started, it will continue to burn because it's an exothermic reaction and the energy given off is enough to make the reactants go above the activated complex to go to products. The dashed line in this plot represents the activation energy in the presence of a catalyst. A catalyst lowers the activation energy of a reaction without affecting the reactants or the products. 
Enter the Arrhenius equation. I'm sure it looks familiar. This equation is the relationship between the rate law constants at different temperatures and the activation energy. Temperatures have to be in Kelvin, and it's important that you do not round while performing the calculation. This is an example problem. Pause the video and give it a try. If you're stuck, just move ahead. There's a detailed answer following this slide. The answer is 98 kilojoules per mole. I will conclude this mini lecture with a blank potential energy diagram with some definitions provided. In addition to these, you should know the activation energy of the reverse reaction, which is not shown, as well as the enthalpy of the reaction, which is also not shown. Lastly, you should be able to tell if this reaction is endothermic or exothermic. I'll give you a hint, it's exothermic. If you're not sure why, you'll want to go back and review prior to the exam. This ends chapter 14. Stay tuned for many lectures on chapter 15 where we'll explore equilibrium constant expressions and introduce ice tables. Feedback is always appreciated. Give the video a thumbs up if you think it's helpful. Stay tuned for more videos on the Professor's Dubois channel.